Well, hi everybody, this is Robin Robinson. This is the Complete Whiskey Course, and let's just get right to this. We are gonna talk about craft distilling. Craft distilling in the age of coronavirus. Look, let's get this straight. We're in trouble. These guys are in trouble, right? We've got an enormous supply chain out there that is getting hurt, and what I'm afraid of is a lot of these guys are gonna fall down um, and not get back up again. Uh, we've got a lot to cover right here, so let's get to it. So, uh, many people in the industry know me from my time when I was with Compass Box. I was the U.S. brand representative for Compass Box. And when I first uh, jumped in with the brand, uh, I can tell you that I was out there spelling the word artisanal <laughs> for people. And um, had to spell that word until, uh, you know, Dunkin' Donuts came out with an artisanal donut, and then suddenly we had to change uh, the messaging on that. We became handcrafted, and then I think McDonald's came out with handcrafted salads, and then one by one, all of the key messaging that we were using out in the marketplace was being co-opted by brands that had no business doing that. And, and then what happened, which was interesting, and I saw the early roots of this, was one by one these small little American distillers were popping up out of nowhere. And if you go all the way back to the 1980s, you'll find a guy uh, by the name of Hubert Germain Robin. Uh, Hubert was a fourth generation cognac distiller that had come to the United States to sort of free himself of the restrictions in cognac imposed by the singular grape that they use, which is Uni Blanc and wanted to really uh, uh, luxuriate in, in the, uh, all of the different grape varieties that were in Northern California at that time in Napa and Sonoma. And was the first guy out there to really do a small crafted spirit. In his case, it was Brandy. Uh, uh, George Rupf, um, who um, eventually started uh, St. George, uh, he along with Lance Winters, who's currently there now, um, were the, the, the next guys in line to, to, to pull something together. Uh, in their case, it was vodka. They created a very famous Hangar One vodka, sold that off to Proximo. Uh, St. George Spirits was really launched from there and uh, became uh, today uh, one of the leaders in the craft movement. There was uh, Rick Wasman, right? Rick Wasman from Copper Fox. He's got some Copper Fox right here. Rick Wasman from Copper Fox, who got early invested in the idea of smoking barley uh, in America to approximate the type of smoke that he was picking up in Scotch whiskeys and did an apprenticeship uh, on Isla at Beaumore with uh, Jim McEwen, who was then the, the director of marketing at that time, before uh, Brooke Lottie opened up, and started a craft distillery in Virginia. Um, it, Todd Leopold, uh, who is, uh, I think, and, and Todd, don't get you know embarrassed about this, but I definitely think one of the best uh, of the new uh, uh, group of distillers uh, in America, maybe the world today, uh, with Leopold Brothers, and Todd and Scott, uh, his brother, um, started out as brewers and with a, 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 brew, a brew pub in, in Ann Arbor, moved uh, the whole operation and the family moved down here to, uh, or down there to Aurora, Colorado, and started experimenting in whiskeys and brandies and flavored whiskeys and, and now is leading the way with, uh, I mean, he's got a brand new phenomenal malting facility there and, um, uh, he's uh, you know a brewer at heart and a Bavarian brewer at heart, so he comes at this in a very, a very different way. This is a, a rare Maryland style rye whiskey that uh, he has developed there, which is a little bit different than the typical, what we call the Pennsylvania or Monongahela style. That is very very high in rye, a little bit of barley. In this case, uh, there's a secondary grain in here. Typically, it's corn. Um, you've got, um, here's Alan Katz uh, here in New York City at New York Distilling. Uh, and then right down the road from him is uh, Colin Spolman um, at uh, Kings County Distilling here, the, uh, his very uh, famous uh, ubiquitous bottle. 
right there. And uh, and these guys um, started up in New York's uh, New York State um, right along the same time as um, Gable and Ralph Lorenzo up here at Hudson at Tuttletown, and really kind of took the entire uh, state of New York by storm by uh, producing locally uh, made uh, and locally grown uh, New York State whiskeys. Um, in, in their case, uh, they did rye, they were doing bourbon, they were doing corn whiskey, baby bourbon. Um, uh, one of the big things about New York distilling is, uh, is their rye. They're very uh, specific um, and very focused on that. Uh, over here at Kings County, they're doing a lot of bourbon, peated bourbon. Um, and, and what all of these uh, distilleries are, are telling you is that all of the old rules, all of the the conventional thinking about distilling, all of those things, they're 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 off the table. There's an entire new way to approach whiskey. Here's a here's a great example. Here's some guys over here in Texas. Um, this is uh, Robert and Jonathan Licorice or Licorice um, uh, in Denton, Texas, up there in the near the Panhandle. Uh, at Iron Root, and um, they were just actually awarded uh, Icons of Whiskey uh, Best New Bourbon uh, of the Year um, this year in 2020. What they're doing is very, it, it, again, very um, unconventional. Typically, bourbon is mostly corn, as we all know, uh, and then the secondary grain is typically rye or wheat, and that's typically called the small grains or the flavoring grain which gives the individual character uh, to that particular bourbon and then followed by a little bit of barley. Uh, in their case, uh, they're substituting a good portion of the secondary grains with an heirloom corn. So they've developed about five or seven different types of heirloom corns, if I can remember, um, Oaxacan purple <laughs> and uh, uh, magic manna and of course they're using bloody butcher corn which is like an old moonshiners corn but all of these are actually quite different and they bring different flavor profiles and they're substituting them for portions of rye or um, wheat uh, in the bourbon recipe um, uh, so they're doing some fun things right there um, here's a guy over here, and this is an old label. This is uh, uh, Adam Spiegel at um, Sonoma County Distilling. Um, and, and Adam uh, was a, 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 um, a, a, an acolyte of, uh, of Hubert, Germain Robin, so he got a little bit of that French style methodology of distilling. So he's, for example, very dedicated to um, single pot still distilling. Um, he does also a marrying of hearts in a cuvee. He uh, uh, barrel conditions the water before using that to bring down uh, for, for bottle proof. And these are very, these are techniques that you would find in a, a cellar master in, in, in cognac or armagnac. So these techniques are not typically from the Scots-Irish way of creating whiskey, but, uh, but very different. Um, and then we've got uh, some, some new guys over here. Uh, this is sort of like New Age Kentucky. Um, uh, these guys here at New Riff, um, uh, they, they blew up onto the scene at one time. Um, uh, they were well-funded enough. Uh, uh, the owner, uh, 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 Ken, um, uh, 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 sorry, Ken, I forgot your last name. Um, uh, the owner um, owned one of the biggest stores in northern Kentucky uh, called uh, uh, the, the Party Source, and uh, had one of the he and uh, Jay Ayersman, who was his spirits buyer and uh, general manager, um, at one point had maybe one of the best and biggest uh, whiskey and bourbon collections uh, in any store anywhere at that time. This is early in the 2000s now, before it became a big thing. And uh, he sold the business to his employees and built the New Rift Distillery right there on the premises. Uh, he owned, uh, the, he owned the, the, the lot that it was on uh, at Filibuster. Now, Filibuster is an interesting story because it brings up another type of small brand here in America. Uh, there is no Filibuster Distillery. 
Uh, this is what we know as a sourced whiskey. And a lot of the sourced whiskeys come from one particular place that, you know, the three magic letters that almost everyone ha has heard of called MGP. And MGP was an old Seagram's distillery. Had, uh, the, the actual distillery had been around since the 1800s. Seagram's bought it right after Prohibition and uh, turned it into this massive alcohol factory where they went belly up in 2000. Uh, the, the, uh, all of the assets of, of, uh, of Seagram's got you know, picked apart by um, a lot of larger companies and MGP um, was eventually bought by Midwestern Grains Products. That's, that's what MGP means and that they're the current owner. But essentially they kick-started all of the the brand new rye whiskeys and a lot of the bourbon whiskeys that were starting to show up in the early 2000s. So for example, High West was a great example of that. Um, um, Redemption was a great example of that. Um, uh, James Pepper was a great example of that. Uh, and these guys uh, were a great example of that too. And uh, they've done some really interesting stuff right here. Um, they've got a couple different brands. Uh, Filibuster is uh, is one of them. So, um, so some very interesting uh, story behind uh, behind all of those MGP whiskeys. Pretty much kickstarted uh, the entire idea about what rye whiskey is. Now, here's some folks here from my hometown in Pittsburgh, uh, Wiggle, and Wiggle's got really a great story behind it because. Um, uh, Wiggle is actually the anglicized name for a man whose name was Philippe Vigol. And uh, he was a Czech national who was living in western Pennsylvania uh, during right about, uh, right about the time of the Revolutionary War. And he was a, uh, a farmer. And all uh, farmers in western Pennsylvania were also rye distillers. And um, Washington and Hamilton uh, got the idea. It's like, well, hey, let's fund... Uh, the war we just uh, we just won uh, against the British, and how would we do that? Hamilton said, and Washington says, when I was over there as a colonel in the British Army fighting the French in the French and Indian Wars, um, I knew that all of those rye farmers over there were making whiskey. They were making rye whiskey, so there's a great place for us to go and uh, and collect some some revenue. So the first excise tax in the United States was imposed on farmers in, in Pennsylvania and in and, and, and Virginia and Kentucky, uh, a little bit in Ohio. And of course that caused what we now know as the Whiskey Rebellion and a lot of tar and feathering and running people out on a rail um, happened as a result of that. And one man was um, uh, captured by the militia that was sent in and held for sedition and his name was Philippe Vigol um, and uh, he was one of the uh, the people who had actually kind of started the riots there and uh, however Washington uh, absolved him uh, uh, sent in a stay of execution uh, even though the uh, the gallows were already built and he was ready to hang for his uh, his crime um, and then so Wiggle um, is uh, in honor of uh, Philippe Vigol. Like I said, uh, Wiggle is probably is the anglicized version of, uh, of his last name. And these guys are in Pittsburgh and, and, they're, do and they're making, obviously, as you can imagine, rye whiskey. Uh, they're making a, 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 an entire array of products. I've got some Geneva from them, some bourbon and some um, liqueurs they make. Uh, but this is a straight white rye whiskey right here. It's about a three-year-old whiskey, and uh, this is all organic um, uh, uh, Monongahela rye that's uh, grown in the Pennsylvania area. So it, the, the whole thing behind all of these guys is they all have this brilliantly unique <clears throat> and individual approach as to what whiskey was, what whiskey is, and what whiskey can be. And so... As I mentioned, all of the, the traditional ways of thinking of whiskey are off the table. Now, what does that mean? <clears throat> well, here's a couple numbers to, to kind of sober us up. Uh, in order to distill in the United States, um, you have to be granted by the federal government something called a DSP. 
um, a distilled spirits plant and you're given a number and these numbers have been tracked uh, for about over a hundred years now. Uh, but essentially what it's telling you is that uh, you're running a manufacturing plant and um, it has uh, certain safety things, you're in a certain zoning area and, and uh, you uh, agree to follow specific type of rules in the manufacture of these spirits. Well, in the year 2000, there were about 60 of these DSPs in the United States. And to give you an idea of the mushroom cloud that is <laughs> descended uh, in the distilling industry, we just quit counting at 2,000. I mean 2,000 DSPs. So in 20 years, it's 2020 right now, in 20 years um, it's been a, you know, a 2,000 fold increase in the number of distilling plants. Every state, every state in the union has at least a dozen. I believe California leads with over 150. There's over 100 in New York State. Um, Texas has quite a few. Um, and uh, these are, all, and their next, I mean, Brooklyn has, I think, 12. I think there's 12 DSPs in Brooklyn. I believe there is a DSP in every borough in New York City now. Uh, there's one in, in Bronx, in Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, and there's two in Manhattan. Um, and so in this time of the virus, uh, these guys, their businesses uh, are severely impacted. And here's a couple reasons why. Well, so what we've got now is a pulling in of resources and a shutting down of the supply chain and the companies that are going to be best able to survive that are the companies who are putting out massive amounts of product and actually have an international um, uh, financial footing. And the four big guys out there are Beam Suntory and Diageo and Pernod Ricard and Bacardi. And then they're followed by a, a, a number of others. There's LVMH and there's um, Constellation. But these are really large companies and uh, that are built to withstand uh, momentary, and we're hoping this is all momentary, pressures and downward pressure um, of the, the U.S. economy. And um, one of the, the ironies is that a lot of these brands that I'm looking at here on my table, a lot of these brands were born right about the last recession, which was in 2008. That's when you saw an enormous amount of people leave the professions they were in, leave the businesses they were doing it, and took up doing something that they wanted to do, and they made significant investments, capital investments, in, uh, in starting up distilleries. And that's pretty much where the, the huge blossoming actually took place at that point. So you've got all of these 2,000 or so distilleries, and we all knew that they all weren't going to, to last a long time. The marketplace can only handle so much product before it, at one point it, 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 it just plateaus out. There was already a sense of fatigue um, in the front two tiers of the three tier system. You're already starting to pick up fatigue on the distribution level uh, and then on the retail and um, uh, trade level as well because of the proliferation of brand after brand after brand after bourbon after bourbon after rye after gin after vodka and a thousand variations and then what that spurred was this massive worldwide explosion of distilled products. So now, for example, where's, um, I mean, like we've got like Amrut, right? And then uh, Paul John from, from India, of all places. I mean, no one expected quality, world-class single malts to be coming out of a country like India. France now has I believe 
50 dedicated distilleries that are dedicated solely to grain distillation, not just a uh, a revamp of their stills that were, have been used to make brandy for hundreds and hundreds of years, but actually, you know, with specific grain distillation um, uh, distilleries. Um, uh, Wales uh, had Penderin for about 12 years, and now there's a second one there. Scotland has now spurred an enormous amount of distillation. Um, after in the 1980s, they closed down. There were about 30 distilleries closed during the 1980s. Uh, Germany, Austria, Sweden, um, the Czech Republic, Australia is about to explode. Um, uh, Ireland, which was down to two and then three distilleries for most of the 20th century, now is coming online with about 45 or so new distilleries. And that's an enormous amount of product. And these are very scary times. So, one of the things that I would ask all of you to do is go out and support your local distiller. You know, if you're in Colorado, you've got a lot to choose from. Boy, you've got uh, Boulder Distilling, and you've got Woody Creek, and you've got Leopold Brothers, and um, uh, the, the, the Colorado's got an enormous amount of local whiskeys out there. Um, that are waiting for you uh, to come and pick them up. Illinois uh, has few spirits, has CH. Um, Minnesota has, um, uh, where are these guys at? Minnesota has, um, uh, oh yeah, here they are. It has uh, um, uh, Far North Spirits here. Um, uh, who else we have? We have Texas over here that is uh, obviously... Um, there is uh, the Garrison Brothers, and, and here is Balcones. Um, here's another guy from Colorado that I just met the other day, um, a, a brand called Rocker. Uh, I've never seen this before, but this may be uh, my new favorite uh, packaging right here. It's actually um, uh, looks like an old oil can, uh, and this thing actually rocks over and then f uh, catches itself on this foot right here. So that's actually pretty unique. Uh, here's Rebellion Rye here from Pennsylvania as well from some guys called uh, Red Pump Spirits in Washington, PA. Washington, PA, uh, uh, ironically, is close to really where the flashpoint of the Whiskey Rebellion was uh, back during those days. Um, so you've got whiskeys from all over the world. Here's some, uh, let's see, we've got Star Wars right here, right? Um, this is from Australia. And then from Japan, right, we've got uh, 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 um, companies like uh, Ishido right here, Ishido Okuto at Chichibu, um, who's one of the, the new um, wave of, of Japanese uh, distillers and blenders, and um, uh, along with White Oak and, of course, Nika and, and Suntory, who are kind of like Nika and Suntory right now are kind of like old school uh, Japanese whiskeys. Uh, we've got Fukano and o Oishi that have uh, ha have uh, landed in the United States, and a lot of what we now refer to as aged Soshu, which is a rice-based distilled spirit and then aged. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so there's this massive, massive explosion. So, as you can imagine, we are in the, we're in a, in a, in a delicate time, in a delicate time right now. So, my, my, uh, my quest today is to, is to bring the acknowledgement of all of these young distillers uh, uh, to your, uh, uh, to the front of your, your head and, and, and hopefully for you to keep them in mind. Um, as you go out and continue to make purchases, uh, thankfully in most states, the liquor stores are now deemed essential businesses, so they're open. And I'd hate uh, to have uh, some of these guys um, prematurely disappear um, from the marketplace. Um, they're putting out some excellent whiskeys, uh, also gins and, and um uh, and vodkas and uh, some other d types of uh, disti distilled spirits as well and are deserving of your and my support. So that's kind of like the, the, the craft whiskey roundup here um, at the Complete Whiskey Course. 
Um, so go out there and buy. Uh, make sure your hands are clean. Wash your hands. Remember, 20 seconds. Uh, use hand sanitizer as much as you can. Uh, stay indoors unless you really have to uh, to get something. A lot of this stuff uh, you can actually order through Drizzly, um, or you can do pickup. Call the store. Call your your uh, your local liquor store ahead of time and then uh, have them either deliver or do a, uh, a drive-by pickup but uh, stay safe uh, stay healthy out there and uh, we'll all get through this um, and uh, slunge to your health